So what could such times include f- for us? Yeah, if, if we were to find ourselves in, in, in an in-between time, whether, whether an in-between time of days or weeks or an in-between time of, of years, what, what could it be for us? So we see from Jesus' life the extreme importance of periods of apparent inactivity. And I think that's the first thing that the Lord wants to encourage us in. When you feel that actually you're not doing what you should, that you're not pursuing the, the, the call of God, that, that you, you're not being the person that God should, should be making you into. So here we are on the 29th of December. And of course, we just celebrated the wonderful occasion that we do every year the coming of Christ. But in three days' time, we'll be celebrating again. This time, celebrating the coming of a new year. And I just wonder, what, what, are you, what will you have done in between those two events? Anybody want to volunteer? What will you have done between Christmas and New Year? Speak up. Sorry? Sleep. Sleep. <laughs> so Catherine would have slept. Seeing lots of people. people, Absolutely. That's probably one of the reasons why Catherine will be sleeping. (laughs) Eat. Eat. Yeah, absolutely. That's quite an important part of uh, of, uh, these few days, isn't it? Anything else? Anything else that we expect to do? Watch films. Absolutely. So there's there's quite a few things that, um, that we either have done or are still planning to do in that roughly a week's period between Christmas and New Year. It's a real in-between time, isn't it? In between those two celebrations, in between two great big parties. And um, sometimes we know also that those times can be a little bit odd, a little bit flat, particularly if you don't have family to go and see, particularly if you don't have friends around the place. We also know that those in-between times, actually when you look back on them, can appear to be a little bit of a wasted time. You, know, you stagger back to work after New Year going, oh my goodness, I need a holiday. <laughs> that was too much like hard work. And what did I actually achieve? Well, I've driven miles, I've drunk a lot, I've eaten a lot, I've given a lot of presents away, and yeah, it's all been a bit much and over the top. And so whether this in-between time, in-between these two celebrations is a a, a time of real celebration or actually a time when you're, you're battling a little bit, these sorts of times get repeated often in our lives. Indeed, not just the one I've just identified, but in Christmas and New Year, which, of course, a lot of us will see probably 80 times in our lives. But um, there'll be many other, other things that happen, which either at the time or we look back on again, that was a strange kind of time. It, it felt like I was in between two things. And uh, you know what? There's a lot of famous biblical characters who have been through exactly the same. And the Bible records, and I I just want to mention three of them. First of all, Abraham, when he was told that he was going to have a son, and the Lord was there in front of him and said, Abraham thought it was just a stranger, but it was the Lord. He said, in a year's time, I'll return and you'll have a son. What did it feel like? for Abraham and Sarah in that time between that word being spoken and Sarah realizing that she had conceived. Have you ever put yourselves in their position? Put yourselves in the position of of Sarah who had laughed when she'd heard this. It's never going to happen. So was she brimming with faith and excitement during those days or weeks? What about Abraham? Did he go through times of doubt, times of excitement? 
must have been a very odd in-between time for those two individuals. Secondly, how about Moses? Um, as you'll remember, he, um, he did something pretty darn stupid, thought he got away with it, and then realized he hadn't. And so he fled to Midian to escape death at the hand of Pharaoh. And do you know what? He stayed in Midian a long time. The Bible doesn't really record why, but probably it's because actually the time between leaving Egypt and finally then returning to Egypt was a time that it was a lot easier to stay where he was than to go back and face the music. And it took a pretty dramatic event of the burning bush to capture Moses and to remind him that he wasn't just a shepherd in Midian. That was not his call and purpose. He'd had this lengthy time where, yes, he got married and and so on and so forth, but it was an in-between time. In between him doing something darn stupid and him finally responding to the call of God. And then the third example I thought of was David. David, when he was first chosen and anointed to be king, as a young, young teenager probably, perhaps even younger than that, and it was years before he actually ascended to the throne. That was a massive in-between time for him, an in-between time where he knew where he was headed, and yet he had to be absolutely certain that he walked that road with God and he didn't touch the head of the king who the Lord had anointed at that time. Again, a place of of faith, of confusion, of tension, a, 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 a time where he fled for his life and gathered a a kind of band of revolutionaries around him. I mean, a real mix of a time, but it was in between two big events him being called, and that call to be realized. So what could such times include for us? If if we were to find ourselves in in an in-between time, whether whether an in-between time of days or weeks, or an in-between time of of years, what what could it be for us? And I wonder if, if any of you have got some ideas sparking of times that you've been in between. Maybe you've been between jobs and kind of had that odd sense of, well, I I really ought to just kind of relax and get ready for the next job, but actually I've got all these things to do in the house and and I never normally have a month off to be able to do this, so let's run around and do lots of stuff. Maybe uh, you've been in that horrendous situation where you found a lump and you're now waiting for a diagnosis. A very different in-between time. A a, a time of enormous tension. Possibly of tears, of fears. Uh, Maybe one that pretty much I suspect all of us can relate to, where we've received a prophetic word and we're going, God, when is this prophetic word actually going to become reality? And sometimes those in-between times can last a long time. And we hold on, and then we doubt, and then, th- then we think maybe we got it wrong, and we heard it wrong, and it didn't really mean that, and, and then we get back to that place of faith, etc. It's an in-between time where uh, 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 circumstances and our minds and our hearts can play havoc with, with, with what we're feeling. But today, on the 29th of December, we are in a short in-between time, which is perhaps generally more positive because it's bounded by two celebrations. But actually, they really are all to do with Jesus because first of all, we celebrate his coming and then we celebrate a new year, which I know that um, uh, the, the modern world is trying to change this, but in my day, it was before Christ and after Christ and the whole Gregorian calendar was based around him. And so that's why the 1st of January is significant because actually it 
even that harks back to Jesus' life and his ministry. And so I want to actually look at some in-between times in Jesus' life and see what we can learn from those, uh, from, from those times that Jesus walked through. And um, <clears throat> have you ever wondered what Jesus did in perhaps uh, his most major in-between time, which was his birth and the start of his ministry 30 years later. Now, uh, try and get your heads around this. Here he is, the son of God. And he's kind of waiting around, twiddling his thumbs as a carpenter in Galilee. Surely there must have been times when he thought, what on earth is this all about, Lord? What am I doing? (laughs) Come on, we've got a job to do. And actually, we know very little about his life in those, uh, in those 30 years. But we obviously know he was born. We know that eight days later, he was presented at the temple in accordance with Jewish custom. He was visited by the Magi uh, and then uh, found himself with his parents escaping to Egypt. He then subsequently returned to Nazareth. And according to Luke's gospel in chapter 2, verse 40... He grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. So even back then, there was something special about him. When he was 12, he and his parents went to Jerusalem to the temple. And you know the story. Um, I still, I have to confess, find it find, find hard to get my head around the fact that his parents actually travelled for a whole day away from Jerusalem before twigging that their son wasn't with them. But, hey, it was a big family group. They assumed and assumed and eventually realised that their assumptions were wrong. So they legged it back to um, Jerusalem, I suspect, in a, a little bit of consternation. Now, OK, Mary had had, by that time, 12 years to begin to get her head around the fact that, that this was God in the midst of their family. But still, they were parents. And, um, uh, and of course, um, he spent, he'd spent three days with the teachers in, in the temple. And again, according to Luke, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and at his answers. So for me, that, that begins to point to perhaps what Jesus had been doing for that previous 12 years. Because you don't get to a position where you amaze the teachers by twiddling your thumbs and just being a carpenter's son. And I, I would suspect that actually he had, even at the young age up to the age of 12, really been getting his head, his heart, and his spirit around everything that the Scripture said concerning him, concerning the times, the places, that he was actually preparing himself. I suspect he, he spent an awful lot of time embedded back in that relationship with his father. That's why I I think Luke could record that he was filled with wisdom and that the grace of God was upon him. So uh, Jesus was not wasting that in-between time, but actually he was using it to become the man he needed to be to operate in his ministry. And then the the next thing that the Gospels record about... um, Jesus' early life is actually as an adult, being baptized by John the Baptist. And Luke records that he was about 30 years old and that this was the moment his ministry began. So having lived for the first 30 years of his life, uh, as a, like I've said before, a virtual non-entity, because he knew why he was on earth, Uh, And that was clear from the answer he gave his parents when his parents found him in the temple courts at the age of 12. And he said, why are you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? So Jesus knew what he was about. Jesus knew why he was here. Okay, it wasn't a shock to him when the dove appeared from heaven and, uh, and he was baptized. 
He had 30 years of preparation. In that in-between time, in between his birth and the beginning of his ministry. And he actively prepared during that time. So he ensured that when the moment came, when the starting pistol was fired and he was baptised by John, he was entirely ready for the path set before him. And of course, that path started with the most significant and severe temptation you could imagine. So, just as well he was ready. So that was one key in between time that I wanted to, uh, to expand upon. The next one is a much shorter time between Jesus' resurrection and his ascension into heaven. And so here's a question. How long was that period? How long was Jesus on earth after he rose before he ascended into heaven? Can anybody tell me? 40 days. Thank you very much. And there was a few others. And I think one of them was John. And uh, Catherine and I had a, had a bit of a wager that John would know. Well, <laughs> So well done if you, if, if you knew it was 40 days, because I have to confess, I didn't know how long it was. But thankfully, again, Luke, bless him, who I've quoted quite a lot already, um, recorded that in, in the first book of Acts. And um, uh, in Acts 1, chapter 3, he says that um, <clears throat> after his suffering, he presented himself to them, them being his disciples and followers, and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So immediately, Luke tells us what Jesus did in that in-between time. First of all, he provided convincing proof that he was alive. He was no ghost. He was no apparition. No figment of their imagination. No, he was alive. And indeed, the Greek language that Luke uses is unique to that verse in the Bible. And the words he uses mean that, or refer to the fact that, um, uh, let me just re recap. So what, what did the scripture say? It says, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Now that expression, many convincing proofs, um, refers to proof that carries absolute and certain conviction. Much, much more than just um, evidence that was circumstantial or probable. Uh, no, he made sure that there could be no doubt whatsoever in the hearts and minds of his disciples that he had died, he had risen again, and he was alive. So why did he do that? Why did Luke specifically record the fact that that's what he did? Well, it was important because Jesus knew that in the coming years, those disciples would suffer greatly for their faith. They had better know that what that faith was grounded in was true. So he was using that in-between time in his life to prepare those around him for the life that they were going to be walking through so that they had strength to withstand. So that was the first thing he did. The second thing he did during that 40 days was that he continued to teach them. Now, uh, again, when I began to think about this, I thought, he'd had three years with them for crying out loud. Why did he need to spend another 40 days, a not insignificant period of time? Hadn't, Surely, surely, if they were going to understand it, they'd have understood it by then. And if they weren't, then it was a bit of a waste of time. But actually, I believe, again, this was, that, this was so that he could provide new meaning and new certainty and new revelation from the Scriptures. And even if you remember when um, he walked along the road to Emmaus, the followers he was with didn't immediately recognize him until suddenly the truth of God hit them and they realized that they'd been walking with Christ. 
And so he was able in that 40 days to open up a, a depth of truth that could only happen on the basis of the fulfillment of what Scripture said about his death and resurrection. He was able to, to explain to them the real, deep, world-changing significance of what had just happened. And on the basis of that, he also ensured that they understood that they had to wait for power to come upon them. And that his life and resurrection was for all, not just for the Jews. In other words, in that 40-day period, he was able to transform his disciples and followers from a group of, of dispirited freedom fighters who cared quite a lot for themselves and absolutely quite a lot about the Jews and the Jewish state. He transformed them from that position to true disciples who understood that this was about a calling to the world and that would transform the world. So God used that in-between time through Christ to do what could not have been achieved before Jesus died and rose again and could not be achieved in just a day or two. This was transforming the, 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 the imagination, the understanding, the, the faith of those disciples. In other words, it was crucial to the continuation of his ministry. Without it, it's very likely that his enduring message of hope and salvation would have petered out long before it had even begun. In fact, the disciples would probably not even have pursued it because they thought that actually this was about revolution. So we see from Jesus' life the extreme importance of periods of apparent inactivity. And I think that's the first thing that the Lord wants to encourage us in. When you feel that actually you're not doing what you should, that you're not pursuing the, the, the call of God, that, that you, you're not being the person that God should, should be making you into or that you should be becoming. Don't be dispirited. But get a hold of that, that time, that in-between time of apparent inactivity. Because without Jesus taking advantage of those times, I don't think we would be sitting here today saved, set free, and filled with the Spirit. So let's not ignore the times where we seem to be going nowhere and actually turn back to the Lord and say, Lord, where am I going? A, a, a couple of weeks ago, um, you may remember Bob preached. And um, I was listening away and I already knew what I was going to be sharing today. And suddenly, bomb, bam, bomb, 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 things began to fall into place in terms of what Bob was saying. And I thought, okay, Lord, you, you, you have a link here. You've got a plan between these two rather unlikely sermons. Um, there were three things that I wrote down that Bob shared from his experience. First of all, that he has been guilty of trying to make the plan happen when there seems to be a delay. Second of all, that he realized he had to be prepared to start the journey and rely on God to reveal the plan. And thirdly, he learned that he had to stop and listen and ensure that he'd heard and he'd understood. So three things. Don't try and make the plan happen. Be prepared to start and have it unfold in front of you. And make sure you listen and hear and understand along the way. And I think those three things that Bob pulled out actually encapsulate three key learnings we can take from those periods of in-between times in Jesus' life. What are those three principles? First of all, Jesus prepared. He didn't try to force the pace in his first 30 years. 
What he could have seen as an unnecessary delay was in fact a critical time of preparation. And actually not just for him. So can you imagine if he had tried to force the pace and tried to get into his ministry early, how would his and John's ministries intersected? They wouldn't have done. Because Jesus would have jumped the gun. And so timing is everything. And in that timing, unless we understand and respond, we will find ourselves not ready. And we'll miss God's preparation for ourselves and God's preparation and timing, perhaps for others that are required to achieve his plan. In Jesus' case, it was John. And you can see the same in some of the other examples I've given, that that sense of timing was, was absolutely critical. I talked about Moses. As you know, he, he, in front of a burning bush, and rather than going, oh my goodness, God, if you can do this, yes, you can do everything, I'm, I'm going to do it, go and do what you say. No, instead he goes, I'm not sure I can do that. I mean, what a bloke. Um, and so in the end, in exasperation, God says, okay, Aaron will do it with you. And God then arranged for Aaron and Moses' paths to cross. And so timing is everything in the Lord. And because he kind of knows everything, he kind of knows when we're going to have a bit of a wobble and, and so on and so forth. When that happens, keep pace with the pace he set. Because then your pace will intersect with others' pace and his kingdom will be expanded. So... Number one was prepare. Number two, and I've already begun to drift into this, was take the journey. Jesus took the journey and relied on his father to reveal the plan. And as a result, he learnt a really vital lesson that's recorded in John 5.19, where Jesus says, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. I mean, I, I, extraordinary words that reflect a degree of unity and understanding between Jesus and his father. That reflect a depth of relationship with God that was never going to develop overnight. Because you've got to remember, Jesus was holy man as well. And I suspect Jesus needed those 30 years to get to the stage where he could make that statement in John. And if he had tried to force the, the, the journey quicker, rather than just taking the journey at the pace God had for him, maybe Jesus would have burnt out pretty quick trying to do this his way rather than the Father's way. Indeed, even more than doing it the Father's way, as he said, he only did what the Father did. So again, let's not ignore times of preparation. Because if we, if, if we can get 10% of the way towards that, then I think we'll see the world change around us. So Jesus prepared. And he was happy, content, and committed to taking the journey and letting the plan unfold as he did. And finally, the third thing, the third principle, is learn and equip. Jesus used the in-between times to stop and listen, such that he gained insight and understanding and was able to communicate that to those ar around him. Uh, that, that was the main purpose for that 40-day period. For Jesus to communicate things to his followers to ensure they were equipped. And for him to do that, he first of all needed to learn them and then take that learning and equip those around him. So again, if you are in an in-between time, get hold of it, learn. Because God will take that learning, will use it to change you, 
but will also use it to transform the little world around you. And that is good. So we can see that in between times are critical. They were critical for Christ so that he could gain preparedness for what was to come and so that God could achieve his overall plan through Christ. If they were were that important for the Son of God, how much more important are they for us? And Jesus himself told a parable that demonstrates the the importance of those in-between times in terms of preparedness, taking the journey, and and learning and equipping. And that was the parable of the foolish virgins. So they started unprepared. So even in the in-between time before they needed to be doing a job, they'd done nothing. So when they got to go on the journey, they had nothing. And then when there was a break in the journey, because the bridegroom didn't turn up immediately, they still did nothing. Net result, they were well rested, because the Bible records they fell asleep, but they missed their opportunity because they had no oil. Again, the Bible clearly pointing to the importance of those in-between times. The, those virgins could have made use of that little break in the journey when the bridegroom wasn't there and gone off and got the oil. No, they didn't. They just kept caught up on their sleep. And so they missed out. And uh, I think this is a big challenge to us. What truly do we do in our in-between times? Do we heave a sigh of relief and go, thank goodness there's nothing to do? Do we find things to do? Do we do everything apart from the things that perhaps we should? If you are in such a time now, what are you doing? And learning from Christ, should you be doing anything differently? Should you be preparing? Should you be already taking the journey without really being certain of where it's leading? And should you be being taught and should you be learning so that in the future you can have an expectation that you will equip others? And the thought I just wanted to leave you with is that uh, I believe that actually those times of in-between are probably more important than those times when you're actually, if you like, out there at the sharp end doing whatever you've been called to do. Without the former, the latter won't happen. And so again, I'd encourage you, if you feel a little bit in between this morning, don't be downhearted. Grasp that time and say, right, Lord, now let's do some business in that quiet place. And Lord, I'm going to learn so much so that I can actually stand with Christ and say, do you know what? I think I'm getting to the point where I only do what the Father's doing. And then you'll be able to take the journey. When the moment comes, as it came for all those characters that I've mentioned, when the time came, they were ready. And I love the testimony where you say that that Joseph didn't look like a convict when he stood before the king. He he got himself ready. And if we're going to go out into the world and, you know, make loads of money or or be incredibly... um, uh, 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 um, Full, yeah, full of wisdom and so on in our job or um, you know, start something groundbreaking in terms of uh, transforming poverty in this, in this land or well, go overseas and, and, and rescue children from lives of say, slavery or actually if God has just called us to have a family that is going to stand as a shining example 
in our land as to what family life should look like. If it's any of those things, get prepared. Take that journey. Don't despise anything the Lord calls you to that doesn't seem big enough. Because let me tell you, in his kingdom, he measures size in all sorts of different ways and significance in all sorts of different ways. And this was a God who left his son on earth for 30 years doing apparently nothing. But it tore the world apart in a good way for the thousands of years since. So take that journey, and on that journey, always be prepared to learn through every step that you're taking. And then, to equip those around you. Not because you're trying to show how wonderful you are, but because actually the Lord will draw out from your experience timely words, maybe even just a hug, or a conversation that will transform how those around you think and feel about their own situation. And uh, I'll just finish with a little bit of testimony for, for me. Um, one of the things I've always wanted to do, and you, you may think this is a bit bizarre, but it was to work as a Christmas casual for Royal Mail. Okay, And uh, I've spent the last three weeks doing just that. It's been absolutely exhausting, I have to say. But all the time I'm kind of going, Lord, I, I will never walk these kind of paths normally. I mean, this is completely unique for, for someone in my position to, to go and work in a, a massive mail sorting office. But it was amazing how the Lord opened up little opportunities. And I'm a history graduate, okay? And would you believe it, one of the lads who was working as a Christmas casual was a history graduate. And he didn't have a clue what he was actually going to do. It was one of the reasons why he was working at Royal Mail, because he hadn't known what to do when he'd left university, so he'd done a master's. And now he got his, his history master's, he still didn't know what to do. And so I, I was able just to have... We only got about 10 minutes to talk it through. But I could tell that the fact that he could talk to someone like me in their late 50s, but we won't talk about that, um, <laughs> uh, who as a history graduate, had done things that history graduates don't normally do. It just opened up his mind to the world of possibility where before he was kind of going, I don't know what to do. It was a God moment. And so, you know, in everything we do, if we take the journey, if we kind of seize the moment and say, Lord, I've always wanted to do this. Is this now the time? Then it's amazing whether it's in big or small ways, the Lord will move. Even if it's just, for me, I worked my socks off for three weeks. You could argue I could, because then I could just sleep, because I was working nights as well. And yet, actually, at the end of three weeks, my manager gave me a gift. and said, thank you for how hard you've worked. And I was absolutely blown away, because I'm thinking, okay, this is not what I expected at all. And so even in that, there was a testimony that, that somehow the Lord had communicated through what I did to Anne in a way that he didn't through all the other Christmas casuals. So be encouraged, people. If you are in between, go, kind of go for it. <laughs> go for that in-between time. Don't think that it's a waste of time, and be expect expectant for what is to come in the future. Thank you. Thank you.